When I was 16 years old, I took what was essentially my first trip to Indian country. I rode the train north across the province of Ontario and onto Winnipeg in Manitoba. Crowds shuffled in and out at stops in small towns along the way. With each stop, more and more blue and green-eyed passengers departed until almost all eyes remaining were dark brown. Skin became darker too. I looked around at the other native passengers for signs of recognition. I remember thinking that they saw in my eyes what few people ever did, that I was one of them. That day on the train, my parents, sisters, and I were heading west on our way to a Sinclair family reunion. My paternal grandpa, Elmer, and five of his brothers and sisters were gathering on the grassy banks of Manitoba's Red River for a party. The day of the reunion was clear and sunny, and on a quiet walk with my grandpa, we visited the graves of his parents and ancestors, ending at the monumental grave of Chief Peguis. We had begun that trip in Toronto, where I grew up the eldest of three girls. My father, Douglas, is Cree Ojibwe, Peguis Nation. My mother, Joni, immigrated to Canada with her family from the UK at the age of five. When I was seven years old, my mom's mom, Bubby, to us, moved into our home. Bubby was a German Jewish refugee whose incredible imagination was our constant companion. She spoke often about the importance of a happy childhood. She told us how memories of her early years had helped her to survive later darker ones during Nazi Germany and the subsequent ravages of World War II. Our home was filled with her watercolor paintings that evoked the German fairy tales of her young life. Her inner world was a part of our environment, there for us to engage with whenever we wanted to. In contrast, my dad's parents, Granny, Phyllis, and Grandpa Elmer, visited every year from Winnipeg. I sometimes wondered how our lives might be different if we had grown up closer to their stories too. Bubby was open about the therapy she had undergone to recover from the traumas of the war. It was clear that through this process, she had recovered her ability to share her earlier memories with my mom and with us. But my dad left home when he was a teenager and somehow the strains in his family hadn't healed in the same way. Along with 150,000 First Nation, Métis, and Inuit children in Canada, my grandfather had survived an Indian residential school, or Indian boarding school, as they were called in the U.S. From age 7 to 10, he lived at the Catholic Fort Alexander Reserve School. Fort Alexander was one of close to 130 schools in Canada, and one of 357 in the United States. In the simplest terms, the schools existed to sever children's ties to their families, their ties to culture, and their ties to land, to make room for the expanding settler colonial economy. Indigenous language and cultural practice was forbidden, and children often suffered emotional, physical, and sexual abuse at the hands of the authority figures tasked with managing their education. My grandpa didn't talk to me about his experience directly, but I always knew about it, and I now know that he was recorded saying, the three years in that school were the saddest days of my life. The nuns and the priests were about the most cruel people God ever created. I could never imagine how people who confess or said they were servants of God could be so cruel to children. I have never forgotten that. One consequence of his years spent at the school was shame. My grandfather became a decorated soldier in the Canadian Army. His courage was celebrated many times over but he did not tell his own seven sons that they were native. When he learned this at age eight, my father remembers feeling surprise and then his own shame because in childhood games of cowboys and Indians, he had always played the cowboy, the good guy, not the Indian, who was always the bad one. Growing up, I thought a lot about how Bubby seemed to heal through telling her story and that so many stories untold by Indian residential school survivors meant so much history unhealed and unknown. I grew interested in connecting the past to the present and in the intergenerational impact of the policies that reduced Indigenous land holdings to 2% of American soil 
6% of Canada, and cost millions of Native people their lives. I wanted to amplify the stories like my grandfather's, because when traumatic events occur in cultures and are left undiscussed, it's not just the stories about the traumas that don't get passed down. The transfer of other cultural knowledge is disrupted too. My grandfather, for decades, didn't share stories about his own family or his young life because of the shame he felt at being an Indian. Ultimately, my own family background and my interests in recording these less told histories led me to pursue an oral history project with the nonprofit Voice of Witness, which works to advance human rights by amplifying the voices of people impacted by and fighting against injustice. My book project, How We Go Home, Voices from Indigenous North America, contains 12 first-person narratives. What I observed during the many conversations throughout this project in cities, reserves, and reservations across the continent is that the stories we tell about the past also shape our future. Struggles over memory are also struggles for liberation. Sharing stories helps counteract the erasure of Indigenous life and history. I heard this truth in every conversation I had with Howie Go Home's narrators, who are each carrying memories forward as a way to reverse a form of injustice that has directly impacted them. Althea Guiboche, once homeless with her young children, founded an organization that provides food for Winnipeg's most vulnerable populations. Gladys Raddick, a survivor of sexual violence whose niece went missing along Canada's Highway of Tears, became a family advocate for the national inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. Marian Naranjo, herself the subject of a radiation test while in high school, went on to lead Santa Clara Pueblo to compile an environmental impact statement on the consequences of living near Los Alamos National Laboratory. Indigenous people are doing so much work to restore health to our communities, to recover from the past, to fight against ongoing injustices. By now, you may be wondering, what can non-Indigenous settlers do? We live in a time in which people are increasingly interested in how to make reparations and reconciliations with the past. How might the U.S. make reparations to African Americans for the history of slavery in this country? How might the United States and Canada reconcile relations with Indigenous peoples? One outcome of this contemporary mindset is the ever-growing practice of land acknowledgments. A land acknowledgement is a statement made to recognize Indigenous peoples as stewards of the land and to acknowledge the ongoing relationship that exists between Indigenous peoples and their traditional territories. You may hear one at the beginning of a performing arts or academic event or see one monumentalized in writing at the entrance to a museum or national park. The problem is that in their hurry to incorporate them, many organizations' land acknowledgements are reduced to performative gestures. They aren't fleshed out enough to be doing any good work. Or even worse, they are reduced to their least helpful abbreviated forms, leaving only the part that speaks of the past. But research from the nonprofit Illuminative gives us some guidance about the work a land acknowledgement should do. Their research reveals that 87% of state-level history standards fail to cover Native people in a post-1900 context, and that 78% of Americans want to learn more about Native people, cultures, and contemporary stories. So if a land acknowledgement simply states that yes, this place that we are gathering is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, the Diné, the Choctaw, or the Chickasaw, we aren't doing anything to fill this knowledge gap. We may even inadvertently contribute to ongoing erasure by evoking in our audience's imagination the trope of the vanished, nameless, faceless, prehistoric Indian, the people who used to be here. But this ever-growing practice of land acknowledgement 
can be a helpful first step towards reversing the erasure of indigenous life in North America. It is helpful to remember that we are all occupying tribal land because it offers a starting place for a larger exploration. It requires that we ask, what happened to indigenous people here on this land? What is happening now? And how can we support the efforts of indigenous people to realize whatever dreams they have for how to live here now and in the future? So what if instead of writing land acknowledgements as fixed statements, institutions instead conceive them as the beginning of ongoing conversations? If you use your land acknowledgement as an opportunity to consider how you, very specifically you, your organization, your school, your park, your museum, might make restitutions for the past, then you will be propelled to learn much more about local indigenous land and life. Land acknowledgements exist because settlers moved to these places, signed and then dishonored treaties with the First Peoples here, and carried out genocide. But relations between settlers and indigenous people are not history. There are ongoing battles over the land and its resources. To acknowledge Indigenous land, then, is also an acknowledgement that Indigenous people still have different ideas about how to live here. To learn more about these ideas, read the work of Indigenous writers, follow Indigenous thinkers on Twitter and artists on Instagram, and then pass that impetus along by advocating for your local school board to do the same. If you pursue this education for a little while, you will come to understand that many Indigenous people today contend that the truest justice occurs through the Land Back Movement, which aims to restore territory to Indigenous people and nations. If you are interested in repatriating land, you can pursue relationships with local Indigenous people and organizations involved in land return. If direct repatriation isn't possible for you, you can donate to a land tax movement or throw a fundraiser for one. Organizations like Oakland's indigenous women-led Sagarate Land Trust are funded by local residents and businesses who voluntarily pay them a land tax for living on Ohlone land. The organization has reworked their three plots for and with the local indigenous community to cultivate traditional and medicinal plants, to practice urban farming, and to provide space for ceremony. One of the plots, a quarter acre site was gifted by non-Indigenous organization Planting Justice after they returned from Standing Rock and asked how they could support Indigenous peoples in Oakland. You can get similarly creative about sharing the time and resources you have. Can you advocate for your workplace or a community organization you are involved with to hire more Indigenous people or to include more Indigenous programming in your events? Can you share your physical space with Indigenous organizations who may not have their own place to hold events? If you work at an organization with significant land holdings, like a farm, wildlife center, or park, can you offer Native people free access to visit their ancestral territories? Can you designate space for Indigenous people to use the land? Hire an Indigenous consultant to help you explore the possibilities. Oral historians think about how sharing stories can act as a kind of testimony. And for testimony to exist, there must also be a witness to it. Witnessing is not the same thing as listening, which can be a passive act. When we witness a story, that story and that person becomes a part of us, and it changes us. I remember feeling this way returning to Brooklyn after my interviewing trips. This act of witnessing has connected me to Howie Go Home's narrators in a way that makes me feel accountable to them, even years later. Ultimately, these stories are now making their way into classrooms across the country. On good days, I like to think that in a small way, they might help a new generation of North Americans forge a more just future. So when you, Start thinking about how you or your organization might engage with the history of these lands in new ways. Ask how you can be a witness to these stories and who you can make yourself accountable to.
Thank you. Miigwech.